On behalf of Ingram Micro and Microsoft, thank you for joining them and welcome to our Licensing Live webinar. We'll be covering Microsoft Azure. Today's Licensing Live webinar is the fifth in a series we are running exclusive, exclusively with Ingram Micro and is ideal if you are new to licensing, looking for a licensing refresher or just want to get up to date without having to impact too much of your working week. I'm delighted to introduce today's presenter, Rich Gibbons. Rich is a member of the licensing school team based out of the UK and has over 10 years sales and licensing training experience in the channel. Plus is part of the team responsible for Microsoft's Get Licensing Ready training portal, which has helped thousands of partners understand licensing across the world. Okay, without further ado, let's get uh, over to Rich. Rich, over to you. Okie dokie, thank you very much. So hello everyone, um, today we're going to be looking at Microsoft Azure, so we're going to look at some of the sales aspects as well as the licensing aspects and the plan for today is that it will be very much a, a training session so any questions that you've got, you know, ask them or if you think of them after the session, you know, get in touch with the Ingram Micro team and ask them as well. So to begin with, the first thing that I want to look at is what is Microsoft Azure? So it's a question that you may well have thought to yourself, have been asked by a colleague and or a customer. Um, so this is one answer. Azure is Microsoft's cloud computing platform, a growing collection of integrated services for moving faster, achieving more and saving money. So while that does technically answer the question, it also doesn't really tell us that much about what Azure is or does or when it may be used. So another way that I like to look at it is this. Here you can see 50 different Azure services. By no means an exhaustive list, this is just some of the things that Azure can do. Partly to give you an idea that, wow, you know, this is this is expansive. Look at the breadth and the depth of the Azure services, but also so that we could use this to take a look at things to help you get started with Azure. It's one of the hardest things as a, a salesperson or a partner when it comes to Azure is where to start. You know, you look at all these services with, with different names, and, and you think, well, you know, how do I begin? You know, I need to pick up the phone and talk to a customer. I want to talk to them about Azure, but how do I start that conversation? Where do I begin? So what I want to do is look at four very common everyday workloads that are perfect for starting an Azure conversation with your customers. And those workloads are virtual machines, storage, backup, and site recovery. These are all things that customers will be doing on-premises or thinking about doing on-premises and it leads that conversation into Azure very, very nicely. So if we look at these individually in a little bit more detail, virtual machines is the first one. And you know, virtualization has been getting ever more popular over the last few years. And I think you'll be hard pressed to talk to a customer now that isn't doing some element of virtualization on premises. And the reasons for virtualizing, it reduces how do I spend reduces the, the amount the customer needs to spend on powering and cooling that hardware, reduces the risk of hardware failures, makes it easier to patch and manage the software in the virtual machines, and it also gives that flexibility of being able to move virtual machines around as and when needed. So organizations happy about these benefits on premises. So the next logical step really is to do that in Microsoft Azure in the cloud because that enhances those benefits even more you know the customer then they don't have to buy any hardware for these servers Microsoft will do all that they don't need to power and cool anything because it's all up in Microsoft data center they don't need to worry about you know, hardware bits of hardware breaking patching and updating that underlying operating system all this is looked after by Microsoft so if you're talking to an organization, this is a great place to start. Something that they're familiar with, that they're already doing. Now let's talk about doing that in the Azure cloud, helping them get started and moving to Azure. The next thing to look at 
is storage. So we all know, you know, ourselves individually and our organisations were creating more and more data each and every day. And typically within, within an organisation, that data will be retained because some of it is critical and some of it you, you never know. You know, you might need that document again. You might need that proposal. You might need one of the 12 different versions of it that you created over the last six months. So it's kept and it's retained. And for an organisation, keeping these on what we call tier one storage, which is you know, it's expensive. So you know, tier one storage is brand new hardware. It's fast. It's efficient. It's expensive. So organisations can use what we would call tier two or tier three storage as well. Cheaper storage hardware. It's not as fast. So you can put the non-critical data on there. But that still brings with it its various range of problems and things that, that are required. So hardware spend, powering, cooling, keeping all that up to date. That's still required, just like it is for the servers. It's required for the storage hardware too. So why not use Microsoft Azure? Let, again, let Microsoft take control and look after the, the hardware requirements, the power, the cooling, all those kind of things. And, you know, because the Azure data centers, you know, there are dozens of them and they're absolutely massive. The economies of scale for Microsoft are fantastic. So that cost per gigabyte of storing the data, you know, very, very cheap, very, very effective. So I would definitely talk to customers if they're experiencing issues with storage, either because they're running out of room or because they feel they're spending too much on their storage hardware. Talk to them about storing this data in the Azure cloud. Tied in with storage is the concept of backup. So this is you know, taking the data from the servers, backing it up each and every night so that if needs be, customer organization can restore that data. It could be because of a virus or malware attack, it could be a, a file that was corrupted or it was overwritten and you need a previous version. And backups are typically taken each night, but then retain so that you can restore from 24 hours ago, from last week, from last month, from six months ago. So again, that storage requirement is big. And as we store more data, those backups get bigger. So they require more room to store them. So again, you know, why not back up to the Azure cloud? All those benefits we spoke about with storage apply to, to to the realm of backup as well. So customers, you know, it's quick and it's cost effective and it's efficient. And more importantly, you know, it's easy to do. So it, whether they're using you know, Veeam or Symantec or Veritas or whatever on-premises backup system they're using, the Azure backup agent is very similar. It enables them to do all the key things that they're already doing, but they will be able to, to pay for it in a, a, an ongoing model it will be cheaper per gigabyte, and it will be off-site backup as well. So most organizations, you know, they're, they're keen to have off-site backup because it means if something happens to their primary location, that data will still be available elsewhere, and they'll be able to restore it if needs be. The fourth one is site recovery. So this is all around business continuity, high availability. You know, if something happens... To a primary site, you know, if it could be a, a major power failure or you know, a fire or it falls into a sinkhole or something like that, you know, site recovery and business continuity is all about enabling the business to continue working by having the servers and the critical systems pick up somewhere else. And there, there are two things that happen with this with a, an organization. Either they do this and they do it properly and it's expensive. You know, it may well be that they have a second site that they have just for the site recovery purpose. So they have to you know, rent the, the building, pay the insurance, all that kind of thing. And then the servers that they've got at the primary site, they all have to have you know, physical, typically physical replicas of those at the secondary site. The software will be loaded upon them, so they'll be the same as those primary servers. And then the customer will have third-party software, which replicates the data across, keeps them synchronized, 
And then if anything happens to the primary servers, the secondary servers will be able to pick them up. It's quite expensive, you know, having a second site, buying additional servers and software, the third party replication software is, is rarely cheap. And then you have to you know, keep it configured and maintained and keep turning it on to make sure the secondary site is up and running and, and ready in the event of a disaster. So it can be that customers do it and they find it to be expensive and time consuming. Or, uh, and you know, typically th this may be more the case in the SMB world, that organizations know they should have a comprehensive and robust site recovery program, but they've not quite got the time to set it up as they would like to, or they've not got the budget to, you know, for that initial outlay to get everything up and running and started for something which, you know, hopefully will never be needed. So, so then Azure Site Recovery, that comes in and allows organizations to do the same thing, replicate their servers so that they can come up in the event of a disaster. But instead of having you know, secondary hardware at a secondary site, you can replicate it into Azure. So then if something happens to the primary site, those servers will pick up in Azure and carry on running. So you can see there from an upfront cost perspective, greatly reduces that. From an ongoing cost perspective, it reduces that. And it also means because Azure is cloud, you know, that those servers will be easily accessible from anywhere. So if something does happen to the primary site and you need to send you know, your customer's staff need to go home and all work individually from home or you know, from, from another office, the other side of the country, for example, they'll still be able to access those Azure servers just as easily as from the primary site. So site recovery, it's a, a slightly bigger conversation. It's a, you know, it's a bigger deal to talk to customers about, but it's a very, very straightforward conversation to start. You know, do you have a site recovery plan? Yes. Is it expensive and difficult? Let's talk about Azure. Do you have a site recovery plan? No. You really should have one. Let's talk about Azure. So these four areas are ones I always highlight because these are all things that customers are already doing on premises or in the case of site recovery should already be doing and they give you a brilliant reason to go and talk to them start a conversation about how you as a partner can save them money can make them more efficient and can you know, protect their business and their data better than they are currently so really 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 good any customer quite quickly can see the benefits of, of looking at Microsoft Azure. So I would definitely say, you know, from a sales perspective, when it comes to picking up the phone, talking to customers, or arranging a, a customer event, you know, how to get started with Azure, focusing on these four, I would say very, very good place to start. So, so hopefully that's given an idea of how you can start with Azure, what kind of conversations you can have, which benefits you will see come through. And now as we go through, we're going to look more at the, you know, the licensing of some of these different things. And the first part of that is to look at licensing those Windows Server virtual machines that we spoke about. So you know, if you're going to talk to a customer and tell them that they should start using virtual machines, it's a good idea to know how that's licensed and how it compares to what they're doing currently on-premises. So you can see here, we've got our on-premises servers, and these are licensed with Windows Server Data Center. These still with Server 2012 R2, so under the, the processor-based model. And then got our customers' users over on the right using their Windows Server CALs, their client access licenses for the users and the devices that access those servers. Then, when Azure comes into play, and I'm pretty sure that's what an Azure data center looks like, loads of servers on a cloud. If that isn't how the front of all the data centers are painted, I will find myself disappointed, to be honest. And what you can do in Azure, the customer, you can see here on premises, they've got those ghostly little servers inside the big servers. Those are the virtual machines. In Azure, they can also create virtual machines. And you can see here, they're different sizes. And that's because 
in Azure, you can specify the capacity of those machines. There's a, a large selection of pre-configured servers that we'll see a little bit later. And you can choose the one that, that fits best for your current needs. And you then pay for those virtual machines as you use them. So on what we call a consumption basis. And this is charged per minute. So as you use the server, you pay for it per minute as you're using it. And what do you pay for? Well, you pay, first of all, for what we call the compute. So that's the, you know, the, the hardware, you know, the, the processor time, the storage. You pay for that as the compute layer. But you also pay for the Windows Server as part of that charge. So on premises, we can see you've got the Windows Server license is one cost. And then the Windows Server cows are a separate cost. With Azure, that price that you pay for your VM, that includes the compute and the Windows Server license. And Azure doesn't require additional Windows Server cows. That's all in the access to the Azure VM is included within that price. So for a customer looking to move to an Azure VM, when they look at the, the website or they speak to you and you give them a price per, per minute or you know, price per hour, price per month, however you package it up, that will include the compute and the Windows Server and users accessing that server. So there aren't any you know, additional hidden charges for, for the Windows Server piece or access to it. It's wrapped up in that. And as we go through, we'll look at some of the pricing so you get an idea of, of what that looks like. Because with this, you talk to a customer, right, yep, Windows Server, virtual machines in Azure. I like the idea of this. I can, I can see how it would make things easier. But how much does it cost? And this, this is where most Azure services differ. So you know, typically for, for Microsoft, your know, customers have said, oh, I want to buy Windows 10. How much is it? And there's a price in the price file. And you know they said, oh, I want to buy SQL Server. How much is it? And there's a price in the price file. For Azure, what we call consumption services, so where you're paying for them as you use them, you, know, you can't put a, a definite price on it. You can't, you know, it's not in the in the price list because you're not sure how much your customer is going to use. So the best thing you can do is to estimate the spend. And you know, that's always, from a sales perspective, a conversation to have with the customer that you know, any prices are estimated. And if they, if they change how they use it, prices may change. But this here, this is a look at the Azure pricing calculator for one of, one of our favorite customers, Cyanide's Pharmacy. And this is just so you can see how it works, what it looks like. So what we can see here, Cyanide, they're looking at two types of virtual machines. At the top, we've got Windows virtual machines. And at the bottom, we've got Linux virtual machines. And I think that's an important point to call out that Azure isn't just Microsoft. Um, you know, a, a big portion of the virtual machines that customers run on Azure are running Linux. You can run Oracle and you know, Red Hat, SAP, all these other things. So if you're thinking about which customers to talk to, it doesn't have to be customers that are, you know, 100% Microsoft. Microsoft Azure is a very open cloud platform, which enables customers to work and use what they need to on Microsoft's platform. And what we can see here, if we look at the pricing, you'll see here the green box A1. So that's the instance size. So they've chosen that as the, the size of VM that they want. They've chosen 10 of them. And then... That's going to be for 744 hours. Does anyone fancy putting into the Skype window where they think that 744 hours comes from? Why is it priced based on 744 hours? A couple of things, 20, 24 times 31. Yeah, people are 
people are getting it. Excellent. 744 hours. That's the number of hours in a month. So Microsoft, in the Azure cost, cost estimator, in the price calculator, what they're saying is we're basing this on this virtual machine being turned on all day, every day. And for this A1 Windows machine, for 10 of them, that's going to cost you $558 per month. Now, with Azure, you know, if you want to, if they're uh, non-critical machines, you could turn them off when you don't need them. So, you know, if they're test and development, for example, and people aren't going to need to access them outside office hours, you could turn that virtual machine off at 6 in the evening, turn it back on at 8 in the morning, turn it off at weekends. And, you know, because you only pay for what you're using, when you're not using it, you're not paying that full price. So, you, you know, your money will go further. You know, your, your cost per month will be lower. So you can see there they've got 10 Windows VMs, 5 Linux VMs, and that's that's the total price estimated at $1,283.40. If they turn it off, you know, that monthly cost will go down. If they, you know, if they spin up additional VMs after they've started, or they add more storage or something like that, then that additional, that monthly cost will go up. And that's always important to talk to customers about that, you know, the estimated cost you give them is based on the information they've given at that time. If that changes, that cost may increase. So, so the main takeaway there is to use the Azure calculator to work out that monthly spend. You can see the URL there. But if you search online for Azure pricing calculator, it should be the top result. I know for, for partners, um, you can also access this through uh, through the MPN as well, I believe. So either way, you'll be able to find that pricing calculator. Before I move on to look at uh, different types of virtual machines, I did see a question come in from Craig. So is Azure Site Recovery different to Hyper-V Replica? Um, yes. So Hyper-V Replica is kind of a building block of Site Recovery, but Site Recovery will do more with, with different types of, uh, of virtual machines and things as well. So from a technical perspective, they're similar, but Azure Site Recovery is is kind of the, the next level up, I guess is the, the best way to put it. Um, I would say for something like that, um, I know that uh, the Ingram guys have been doing some tech boot camps and things recently. Um, so if you get in touch with your your con you know your, your contact or account manager at Ingram, I'm sure they'll be able to give you more technical information than I can about the differences between Hyper-V Replica and Site Recovery. So so hopefully that that helps. So now I want to look at some of the the different kinds of virtual machines that are available. Just you know not to go into too much detail, but just to give you an idea of, of what's out there and why. So here we've got general purpose Windows virtual machines, and these are quite small, very cheap, aimed at things, you know, test and development for, for developers, uh, small websites, small databases, and you can see here, you know, very small hardware, you know, one core, three quarters of a gig of RAM. So, you know, if you're, if you're technical, you'll be able to look at that and see, you know, right, yeah, you know, they are quite small. If you're not so technical, you know, I would say almost certainly, you know, your mobile phone is going to be equivalent to possibly the, the A4, you know, maybe the A3. So these are these are very small, and the price reflects that. So over on the right-hand side in the price column, we can see that the A0 starts at 0.011 pounds per hour. So, you know, a tiny, tiny price. So if a customer needs some test and dev, you know, they don't need huge computing power, but they do need some servers. Rather than, you know, if they bought a physical server, they would have to buy something much, much bigger than that, because that would be the smallest available. And they would only use a tiny fraction of what they've purchased. With Azure, they're able to use a very small VM for, for that specific purpose and just pay this, you know, a few, few pence for that. And you'll see there the prices are listed per hour but your build per minute. So those are general purpose ones. 
Microsoft have also made some what they call compute optimized and these are aimed at customers doing very intensive workloads and that you'll see here that they've got you know more RAM more cores higher uh, amount of, of memory as well and these you know as we, as we look at these here you can see that the price for these you know one pound 21 per hour so you know not not much at all and these these kind of servers are good for you know medium traffic web servers application servers that kind of thing and then we move on to memory optimized virtual machines so these are you know, big databases people that are doing what they call in-memory analytics so you know they could tie in well with something like SQL or SAP for example and you know, these servers are bigger but even so the most expensive one there the D15 V2 which as you can see you know it's quite a sizable machine 20 cores 140 gig of RAM which is a lot still you know less than one pound fifty per hour then we've got GPU virtual machines here's a graphic performance unit virtual machines these are things you know graphics rendering video editing anything that needs high graphics intensive workloads so organizations you know, rather than buying these big beefy servers on premises they can use these in Azure and again we're looking at you know, one pound eighty per hour for that top level NC24R virtual machine and then we've got high performance compute so this is aimed at things like seismic simulation uh, seismic simulation sorry molecular modeling uh, financial risk modeling these kind of things again really big virtual machines still only you know less than three pounds an hour and the beauty of these you know, if you've got customers that work in these kind of industries you know uh, finance health video editing graphics computer gaming these this kind of hardware you know to buy this on premises will cost a lot and it might be you know if you're doing let's say some seismic simulation seismic simulation it might be that you only need that for you know a week to run your models or maybe three months for example but if you buy that hardware on premises the customer they buy it they pay for it out of their capex budget they run their models and then when they no longer need it that hardware is still there still sitting in the corner not really being utilized with Azure they can say right it's going to take us a hundred hours to run this simulation we can see that this high performance VM costs call it three pounds an hour so that's going to be 300 pounds and then when we finish we've run the models we can just turn it off and stop paying so Azure enables organizations to spin things up turn things off work with projects as the business ebbs and flows and grows and that is a huge benefit of, of Azure so if you've got organizations which have you know periodical large requirements for computing power Azure is definitely a conversation to have with them and this now is just to, just to think um, you know I don't don't need an answer in the in the Skype window but just to think how much does a customer get charged if a machine runs for six minutes and what we're saying there is right if they run it for six minutes they get billed for six minutes with other competitors it's the case that they will be billed for the whole hour so from a competitive angle Azure is always per minute billing while other cloud platforms typically bill per hour so now that we've seen some of the things within Azure reasons to sell it different types of VMs I want to now look at, at buying and selling so there are three ways to buy Azure customers can buy it directly from the Microsoft website they can buy it through volume licensing or they can buy it through the cloud solution CSP program all of them you know work in different ways you know the CSP uh, is you know the kind of the way forward in, in many many regards and I know that Ingram again have been doing some excellent work around boot camps and and things like that for partners so for more information on CSP definitely talk to your guys at Ingram for today we're going to look at volume licensing specifically open and open value so the first thing to look at with Azure in open we've got these four elements here so monetary commitment 
this is what we call it. You might see it called Azure Credits as well. But monetary commitment, and it's valid for 12 months. So they buy an Azure Credit, some monetary commitment, and it's valid for 12 months. That monetary commitment could be used for any Azure consumption service. So that's where you pay for it as you use it, the VMs, the storage. Some Azure services you'll see in the price list, things like Azure Active Directory, and they're called plans. And they're licensed like Office 365. So for Azure Active Directory, a customer would say, I want 72 of those. And you would say, right, there you go, that's your price, just like normal. For everything else, all these consumption services, you can use this monetary commitment. And as we saw earlier, you need to work to estimate that monthly or annual consumption, how much they're going to spend. And then customers can make additional monetary commitment at any time. So we know now that we have monetary commitment. Let's look at that in a little bit more depth. It's ordered in amounts of $100. And that's US dollars, and it's then converted into local currency. So I know, for example, in the UK, when uh, Azure came out, that $100 was equivalent to £61.09 in the UK. So they used $100. It's a nice round number for everyone to work with. They're valid for 12 months after redemption. So we'll see that in a little bit more detail shortly that... It doesn't align to an agreement, for example. It just runs for 12 months. There's no limit to the number of subscriptions a customer can redeem. So if they keep ordering Azure you know, every two days, that's fine. They can have as many Azure subscriptions as they need. Previous commitments are exhausted first. And what we mean by this is we've seen that there's a, a validity period, so they're valid for 12 months. So if a customer orders some Azure, and then they order some more, Microsoft will make sure that that initial order is used up first before they start using the credits from the second order to make sure that things don't expire for, for no, no real reason. And the reason for that is because unused monetary commitment, unused Azure credits, can't be rolled over into a future period. So you've got that 12-month validity. If you don't use it, you lose it. So Microsoft have, have done their best to make sure that that should never, never really happen. If we look at this in an example, so we've got our customer, Maroon Balloons. They've got an open value company-wide agreement, and they've come to you and said, right, Mr. Partner, I want to order $500 of Azure Monetary Commitment. So here's their timeline. Just into Q1, they come to you with this order. So they place the order and they get $500 of Azure Monetary Commitment. And that runs for 12 months. So you can see there, runs just into the start of the next Q1. It's not aligned to their anniversary agreement or anything like that. It just runs for a full 12 months from when they redeem that subscription. Partway through, they think, right, you know, this Azure is going well, but we're going to need to top up a little bit. We're, we're running low on credit. So they place another order for 200 additional dollars of Azure Monetary Commitment. And again, you'll see that $200 runs for another 12 months. So it doesn't align to the end date of the previous order. It doesn't align to an anniversary end date or the agreement end date. It's always 12 months. So customers will have multiple expiry dates, but they'll be able to see their subscriptions in the portal. So that is how it would work. If someone's adding multiple subscriptions, it's always 12 months for each subscription. And now what I've done is I've put together a few frequently asked questions, things that when I worked um, in a partner, you know, I, was, I was typically being asked by, by the salespeople. And you know, these are in the Microsoft FAQ documents as well. And these are quite possibly things that you've already thought of, or now that you've seen them, you've thought, ah, yes good question. So I just want to look at the answers to these four because these should enable you to cover off a lot of questions that your colleagues may have and your customers may have. How do partners manage that customer account? So work with your customer to be added as a core admin in their Azure portal. 
So that means if you typically offer a service where you manage their, you know, their volume licensing portals for them, you can do the same thing for Azure. How do customers know when their balance is low? So they've added that, that monetary commitment. How do they know when it's running out? You can have some configurable alerts, and they can be sent to two addresses. Those alerts are 30% balance remaining. So if you ordered $100, when it gets to $30, it will email you and say, you know, you're, you're running low on Azure credit. We saw that the credits expire after 12 months. So here, it will email you and say, right, 30 days until this subscription expires. So the customer might say, right, let's pull this project forwards. We've got some expiring as your credit. I want to make sure I use it and do it that way. And finally, the customer can set their own credit balance. So they can say, right, I want to know when we reach $1,000 or $462, whatever it may be, they can set that themselves. And where it goes to two addresses, one, obviously, the customer. Wherever possible, I would suggest that the second address is you as the partner. Because then, you know, you're, you're able to be kept in the loop about what's happening. But also, if the main contact at the customer is on holiday, for example, and an alert comes through that they're, you know, 30% of their balance remaining, the person covering their emails might not know that that's something to, to be concerned about. You as the partner would, and you would be able to add, you know, that value add service of going to the customer, explaining the situation, and making sure nothing happens. Because, for the next question, what happens if the balance reaches zero? The services are suspended. So open licensing doesn't allow billing in arrears. So if the customer runs out of credit in the Azure portal, the services are suspended, you know, the, the lights go off effectively. Data is retained for 90 days, and if the customer adds more monetary commitment, those services will come back up. Um, some of them may need to be redeployed. But, you know, that's a situation the customer doesn't really want to find themselves in. So having those, con those configurable alerts set up and paying attention to them, absolutely key to make sure that they don't reach zero balance. If they're getting close to their zero balance and it's, say, a weekend, you know, and they can't contact you to place an order, they are able to place an emergency credit card order through the portal to keep them ticking over until they can place an order again through their partner. And then finally, you know, we saw that you can order directly from the website. Question, can those direct subscriptions be moved across to open, you know, as a partner? That's something you're probably thinking about. Very Microsoft answer, it depends. Some of them can, some of them can't. The Microsoft answer is to check with Microsoft Azure support on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I'm sure, again, you know, that the guys uh, within Ingram will be able to help you with that as to which things can be migrated across to open. It may be that you know, migrating them across to CSP makes more sense or, or works better, so Ingram will be able to help you have that conversation. So those are some of the key questions that will come up when you're talking to customers and colleagues about selling Azure. And then the next thing to talk about is the Azure hybrid use benefit. So this is something which you may have heard about. Um, it, it came out November last year, I think it was. Um, it was announced, came fully into effect February this year. And the Azure Hybrid Use Benefit, this allows customers to move their existing Windows Server licenses with software assurance into Azure and take advantage of cost savings on those Azure virtual machines. So we saw that there are Windows virtual machines, and this pricing now, this pricing is, is per month. So if we look at that A4 instance at the bottom for a, for a Windows virtual machine, we can see that that comes to £295 per month. If we look at the same A4 machine, but this time running Linux, we can see that it's £185 per month. So quite a cost saving between Windows and Linux. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, what a customer would do if they've got Windows Server with Software Assurance and they want to use the Azure Hybrid Use Benefit, we saw that the 
Windows Server virtual machines already include the Windows Server pricing, didn't we? So what a customer would do, they would actually provision the Linux virtual machine in Azure and then use their Windows Server license to put Windows Server on top of it. So instead of paying £295 a month in Azure, they would be paying £185 a month in Azure and using their Windows Server with SA licenses to cover the operating system. And this is all part of the, the reason behind the change in Windows Server licensing. We saw in the last session it went from per processor to per core now for Windows Server. And that's because, as we've seen through the session, the Azure virtual machines, one of the components is the number of cores that they have. You can see here, general purpose, you know, from one to eight, compute up to 20 cores for a VM, and then those performance optimized compute can have up to 32 cores per VM. So now with, with Windows Server licensing, we can see the rules here, 16 Windows Server core licenses with software assurance allow for 16 cores to be used in Azure across two or fewer virtual machines. So it could be one of 16 cores, it could be two of eight cores, or you know, a combination thereof. If a customer wants to use larger virtual machines, so you know, 20 or 32 for example, then they can assign additional licenses, always in, in bundles of eight, and they can run those larger virtual machines. So if they wanted to run that D15 V2 with 20 cores, <clears throat> they've got their 16 server core licenses already. They apply another bundle of eight, they would be able to use that. So they would apply 24 cores and they would be running that 20 core VM. If they wanted to run that one with 32 cores, they would apply four bundles of eight and be able to do that. So you can see that you know, this, is, this is a brand new benefit for Windows Server. You know, they've never been able to move Windows Server licenses into Azure before. So this is very, very exciting. Great thing to talk to customers about. And we saw that there are two editions of Windows Server, Standard and Data Center. And here we've got our Windows Server Standard servers. So they've each got 32 core licenses applied to them. And these servers are running some virtual machines, as you can see there. And the customer says, right, I'm going to take those virtual machines off that physical server. And I'm going to move them into the Azure cloud. And what happens there, they, they can then assign those licenses, as we've said, those Windows Server with SA licenses to Azure. And they can then run some Windows Server virtual machines in Azure. So you can see there. They've got one VM with 16 cores, and then two that have got eight and two, so a total of 10 cores there. And the rights for Windows Server Standard are what we call alternative. So if the customer has got Windows Server with SA, they can use those standard licenses on premises or in Azure. So you can see they move the licenses from on premises into the cloud. However, for Windows Server Data Center, how does it work? Again, we've got servers licensed very similarly, but here the rights are what we call additive. So Windows Server Data Center with SA, the customer can use those licenses on-premises for their unlimited on-premises virtualization. They can also use those licenses at the same time to license virtual machines in the Azure cloud. And it's important to, to note that while data center gives unlimited virtualization rights on premises, it doesn't give unlimited virtualization rights in the cloud, it still has that limit. 16 core licenses allow two VMs or one VM with 16 cores total. But the big difference between standard and data center, standard is alternative, so either or, whereas data center is additive, so you can use the same licenses on premises and in the cloud simultaneously. So you can see in that diagram there, they've not had to move anything into the cloud license wise. They're still assigned to the on premises servers, 
but they're also running VMs in Azure. And then this is from Microsoft as an example of the cost savings that are uh, available using Azure Hybrid Use Benefit. So on the left, that's the cost of using one Windows Server virtual machine. They've chosen you know, quite a big virtual machine there to come out at four and a half thousand dollars a year. Over on the right, you'll see that green box, the cost of the Azure virtual machine, much smaller now because that's just the just the compute layer. There's, there's no Windows Server pricing built into that. Then on top is the annual cost of Windows Server with SA. And Microsoft are showing that's a 44% annual saving. So if you've got customers that use Windows Server with Software Assurance already, it's a fantastic conversation to have with them about moving to Azure. Now you've, you've already got this SA benefit available to you. Let's start using Azure so you can take full advantage of it. Or if you're talking to customers about upgrading from you know, Windows Server 2012 to 2016, this is a great reason to talk to them about attaching software assurance to that volume license purchase so that they can use the Azure Hybrid Use Benefit, get into the Azure Cloud even cheaper than it is as normal and really make the, use, make the best use of their on-premises benefits and the Azure Cloud. And as a recap, software assurance is required. You need 16 Windows Server core licenses to be allowed to run 16 cores across two or fewer VMs. Standard edition alternative, so on-premises or in the cloud, whilst data center rights are additive to so on-premises and in the cloud. And that brings us to everyone's favorite part of these sessions, I'm sure, the true or false. So this is you know, fingers at the ready on the Skype window. So first of all, Azure credits, you know, that Azure monetary commitment on open is valid from when it's purchased until the end of the agreement. Is that true or false? Amazing. That's straight in there. Fantastic. That's false. Yeah, as we saw, Azure credits are valid for 12 months from time of redemption. Next one, Azure hybrid use rights give unlimited virtual machines in Azure. Again, is that true or false? Absolutely, everyone doing very, very well there. False, we saw there's the limit, two VMs, uh, or one VM, 16 core total across them. Fantastic. And then finally, unused monetary commitment cannot be rolled over to the next year. Even before I'd finished speaking, people were getting the answers there. Marvellous. That is correct indeed. It's very much a case of if you don't use it, you lose it. And that's something you know, it's so important to make sure that customers understand that and when it comes to estimating their spend you know it's best to underestimate initially because you can always add more but if you've got spare as your credit at the end of the year that it's just gone so, so that's a definite thing to take away that getting those estimates right is quite important so that is for me that is the end of this as your session you know i have barely scratched the surface of the, the wonderful world that is Azure. Um, you know, if you've got any questions now, you know, please do ask. Uh, I would definitely recommend talking to the guys at Ingram, finding out when their next boot camps are, talking to them about becoming a, a CSP partner for Azure, all these kind of things that they can help you with because Azure is just becoming more and more popular, more and more important to customers. So hopefully this has given you a good introduction to seeing how you can get started with it, understanding the volume licensing. And now I, I would urge you to, to go forward and speak to Ingram, find out the next steps and uh, become involved in the wonderful world of Azure. You handing over to me, Rich? Yes. <laughs> right. Well, look, when you said molecular modeling and seismic simulation, I Sounds like I just wondered if I was on the right webinar, to be honest. Um, <laughs> you will now be known as a professor, I think. 
Um, well, that, that is technically my job title, so a professor of licensing. Great. So. Okay. <laughs> well, look, thank you ever so much, and thank you all for the uh, interaction, everyone. Really appreciate it. Uh, great stuff. So to end this afternoon's session, I, I just wanted to highlight a few final thoughts and um, some great Azure uh, resources through Ingram Micro. Uh, firstly, when it comes to Azure, Ingram Micro are very busy driving Azure partner enablement either on demand, live online like today or face to face right across Australia and lots of opportunity for partners to learn um, in a way that works for you. In fact, Ingram have just come to the end of their very successful technical uh, bootcamp series. They uh, held those in Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth and Sydney, all were sold out. Absolutely very, very popular and very successful. Some great feedback that we got from there. And they'll be promoting their next set of uh, face to face boot camps in the new year. So please look out for those. I'd highly recommend, though, at the moment is to take a look at the Cloud Elevate on demand training. Now, this includes what I would consider very helpful and straightforward online training that you can access in your own time. As a great first step, I point you towards the Introduction to Azure module. Please take a look at that. We'll include links to Cloud Elevate On Demand in the follow-up email that we'll send out on Monday. So please look out for that. And just moving on to the final slide then, uh, please, Rich. So to finish off, don't forget, join our final licensing live webinar for the calendar year on the 15th of December, where we'll be covering SQL Server. As mentioned earlier, we'll be sending out the follow-up email to you by Monday, so you can access the key uh, info. Um, that'll include the two pages supporting PDF and the recordings and access to the latest promos. And um, you'll also get access to the Licensing School blog there. I also wanted to highlight Ingram Micro's fantastic cloud team. I know they've been given a bit of a um, promotion during this call, but they absolutely are a fantastic team. Um, I'm a bit biased when I say that, but look, I've seen these guys in action and I've also seen the feedback from the partners and I, I would really highly recommend you reach out and make a connection with these guys. You can see the contact uh, detail there of how to email them or, or give them a call. You can see that on the, on the screen there. Okay, in the meantime, if you've got any licensing questions, please email the team at licensinglive at ingrammicro.com. Thanks again for joining us today. On behalf of Ingram Micro, Microsoft and the Licensing School, have a great evening. Thank you.